All right. Hey, everybody. We're live. Uh, hey, Andy. How's it going, man? Doing well, man. How are you? Doing good. Uh, we got a, a great show today. I'm really excited. We've had a lot of a lot of people coming in and joining. I've seen the the numbers on YouTube going up. I'm sure the LinkedIn numbers are are growing as well. But uh, welcome everybody. It uh, it seems that like we've got an exciting topic today. So let us know in the chat where you're watching from. And uh, I'm ready to to talk Copilot, man. It's it's almost here. I can feel it. Yeah, this one's going to be really exciting. Um, I'm glad there's a lot of people that are really interested in this. Uh, I've been living in the Copilot world for a while now, um, mentally, since it was announced, uh, hands-on with it uh, mm -hmm. here for uh, the last little bit, learning a lot, uh, excited to share a lot of that with the community. But also, if you're out there and you are working with it or um, you're really curious about it, let us know in mm -hmm. all the various chats, whether you're on YouTube or LinkedIn or uh, Twitter or wherever you're coming from, uh, let us know uh, what you think about it, what you're excited to try out with it, what you've learned from it. We're all here to to share, and we're just as excited to learn from all of you uh, as we are to share what we've learned uh, here uh, coming up. Yeah, yeah, we've been Andy and I. So we're in the early access program. We've both been using Copilot since uh, August, September timeframe, and what we're hoping to do today is more kind of be like your all-in-one, one-stop shop guide to what to expect with Copilot, kind of, you know, what's going to be available starting in November, what's part of that general availability, what they call GA. You'll see the, the term GA thrown around a lot. That's general availability. What is actually going to launch and what are we expecting to see? Um, we can't do demos yet because, you know, it's not actually GA, but um, with some experience in the background, we're hoping to, you know, basically collate all of the resources that have been out there. There's tons of blog posts, tons of videos, Andy, that we're going to show that um, they've been scattered. And we thought if we could bring everything together and kind of have like a, a co-pilot pre-launch party, basically, um, maybe this could be a resource for those that are looking to just get end to end what what's what can i expect in november and then we can revisit again later on whenever we can actually live demo and get into like uh you know the tips and tricks and things like that um i see daryl you said you're gonna have to add chapters i think we're definitely going to add chapters to this and what we want to do as well is we want to um cut this up into short videos or clips of some some sort so that we can release them that way. So um, you'll probably see between the sections, I think Andy, you wanna do some type of, you know, like welcome to 365 Deep Dive. We wanna talk about <laughs> Word now. We wanna talk about Excel. <laughs> we, we might do a little bit of an intro into each area. That way we can cut it up easier for you um, so that you don't have to watch a two hour video if you don't want to later on, so. <laughs> Or you can watch a two hour video with chapters and you can put yep. it at double speed if you need and you can get to the part that uh, that you're really interested in. But I think you set the expectations pretty well. Um, we are approaching this from a information worker, fingers to the keyboard type level. If you've been with us before, and many of you have, we we did a deep dive just a couple of months ago with Microsoft's Jeremy Chapman, where we talked about the Copilot service how it operates, uh, the ins and outs like behind the scenes, what uh, IT administrators need to do to prepare for Copilot, considerations for security and privacy and so forth. Mm -hmm. This is not going to be that deep dive. This is the deep dive where we want to set end user expectations. We want to really help you to understand what you can do with Copilot mm -hmm. and uh, to help you to temper your expectations to a certain point, but also to show you that this is going to fundamentally change the modern workplace. Because in the short time that we've had it, I think we can both agree that uh, it is game changing. And I don't like to use that word, that phrase loosely, but this is a significant leap forward in the way that an information worker can work day to day. And I'm really excited to dive into it. Yeah, I think the next six months or so are going to be very exciting as we all start to realize kind of that art of the possible and what, you know, connecting the capabilities with 
the needs that maybe we didn't even know what we had. You know, we were doing this kind of drudgery of work stuff and didn't even really consider it drudgery until we have a tool that can help with it. I, I think everybody's going to be, you know, um, having having a new perspective on things, I think, over the next like year or so. It's going to be pretty exciting to, to be in IT. So really, really agree with yeah. that. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's dive right into it. Um, no pun intended. <laughs> Microsoft 365 <laughs> Copilot. What is it? What makes it up? We're going to just cl- like very quickly do an overview, you know, kind of a reintroduction. For those of you who haven't heard of Microsoft 365 Copilot, I don't know who hasn't at this point, but um, at the very basic level, it's three main components, right? It's bringing these large language models or generative AI built on on the open AI version of large language models. It's the data that you have access to in the Microsoft Graph. So Microsoft Graph, if you're not familiar with it, is you know, not only all of the data that you've got, like uh, your your files, your emails, your chats, those types of things, but also the connectivity between that data, the kind of common threads through it, who you work with, who you share files with in the collaboration, who's worked on what, at what point, all of that culminates into the Microsoft graph. And those connections will inform, you know, what goes into and comes out of that large language model. And then it's built into our Microsoft 365 app. So rather than having to switch context all the time and go to chat GPT or go to Bard or something like that, you'll be able to invoke it inside the app that you're already working in. So um, that it makes it, you know, not out of the way to go do what you want to do. <clears throat> so these are the applications that they initially announced is Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, Teams. It's actually grown beyond that since the early access program started. So what we can expect whenever this launches is also OneNote and also M365 Chat, which is your um, your uh, your chat assistant that you can access through your browser, through bing.com or through the sidebar. Um, it's also Microsoft Loop and being able to invoke it inside of Loop components uh, with using the slash command. It's also Whiteboard. So there's about seven or eight different endpoints now at launch as we as we get. So you can see that it's already starting to mature before our eyes, before it's even publicly available. So that's really exciting. So all of this culminates, all this news and everything has landed us to this point late October. November 1st is when Microsoft has announced general availability. And Andy, I don't know if you've heard, like, what does that mean specifically? What can we do on November 1st? I think it's a little bit unclear, right? Like, I think we're going to be able to purchase licenses probably, but do you think, like, are the provisioning of the tenants, things like that, have you heard anything what to expect in your organization? So from what I understand on November 1st, Copilot is going to be available um, for the uh, enterprise uh, enterprises that are not in the early access program. They're going to be able to go through their Microsoft partners. They're going to be able to purchase Copilot licenses Mm -hmm. for their workforce. And then they're going to be able to start uh, rolling out and implementing Copilot for that organization. That being said, just a couple of prerequisites there. If you're an enterprise organization, you're going to need, I believe it's uh, M365 E3 or E5 licensing, Mm -hmm. and then the Copilot license on top of that. Uh, the copilot license is an additional thirty dollars per user per month mm-hmm. um, on top of whatever the uh, the e three or e five uh, licensing cost is. Uh, so you're going to be able to purchase those for uh, your enterprise organization. That being said, if you haven't taken a look at the documentation on data privacy and security and some of the inf- uh, information on how to prepare, your infrastructure and your organization for Copilot, 
I would recommend that you do those things before you purchase the license and set this thing free in your organization. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to make sure that users have access to just enough information to do the work that they need to do and that you're not oversharing. And oversharing, I think, is kind of is the one concern that uh, a lot of organizations have, especially when you're introducing things like a generative AI into uh, into the equation. So um, with that in mind, get ready for it, test it in small pilot groups, because there are a lot of lessons learned. Uh, I know you and I, uh, John, we've compared notes, uh, you know, some of the things that like we've learned and like, uh, our mm -hmm. organizations are pretty mature in the Microsoft apps and services and you and I from uh, an uh, IT pro standpoint, we've been doing this for years. There's a big learning curve here, I think, for rolling this out, but also from the end user mm -hmm. perspective, setting expectations and like what to do. So even though it goes GA on November 1st, you know, and that's the starting point for a lot of organizations, you still want to take a piloted approach to this before you deploy it to the masses. And you really mm -hmm. do need to spend some time working on your user adoption and really understanding the use case uh, around that. Yeah. So, um, a great question from Daryl here. Isn't it 120 grand additional or annual commitment upfront? That is correct. So <clears throat> when Andy says, yeah, it's $30 per month on top of your E3 or your E5, that is, you need a minimum of 300, right? So this is for organizations that have more than 300 seats. Um, I haven't heard one way or another. I'm just gonna speculate wildly at this point. I believe that that is, you know, there's a cost up front, right? That needs to stand up this instance of the LLM for your organization. And I think that Microsoft is just, the scale needs to be minimum of 300 to make that cost work out. That's from my own perspective, I haven't heard either way, but um, that would be what I assume the situation is that has that minimum of 300 users. Um, it's, it's difficult for us as well as as MVPs because like we're both in organizations that have more than 300. I mean, I've got, there's like 400,000 people in my organization. Uh, Andy's like, what, like 160,000 and growing or something like that. So we have that, but you know, I, I'm not, I can't demo. I'm not going to demo out of my EY environment, obviously. And uh, so it's a little bit difficult. Like you're going to see a lot of us MVPs try to figure out like, how are we going to show this stuff off? Because I don't have 300 seats in my demo tenant to, to have a safe area. So we're, we're going to have some interesting times as we launch here, but 300 is that minimum. Um, yeah. It makes it difficult to safely show off the content, but you know, we'll get there. I'm sure, I'm sure Microsoft will figure out a way for people to show it off and, and demo it in different situations. Um, but yeah, if you're looking to prepare for the November date, after the November date even, and like get yourself ready for Copilot, get your organization ready. There is lots of information on learn.microsoft.com, the actual documentation for what you need to think about to prepare. There's a great uh, Microsoft mechanics uh, video that Jeremy Chapman and them published that has, you know, step-by-step. -step. And if you want long form version of that, we were fortunate enough to have Jeremy on with us about three months ago or four months ago to talk about preparing your organization. So on our channels as well, you can go back and, and see what we deep dived about how to prepare and get ready for it. But um, let's, uh, let's, I think, get out of the admin level and back up to the user level yeah. to talk about what, what is possible and what's <laughs> going to happen whenever you get your license provisioned. So... <clears throat> These are, this is the start of us collating the data for you, gathering it all together. And I've put together these summary slides and I've only got, I think two of them that explain at the very beginning what Copilot is going to do. I've prepared these for my organization. I've taken a lot of the detail out of it to make it not quite such an eye chart, but essentially there are seven different endpoints or eight different endpoints if you count M365 chat. And across the board, if you could think about a common thread between these, we're going to look at each one individually, but across all of them, there's two main themes that have kind of surfaced for me in my experience of using these tools. 
And that is you can use Copilot out of the gate to consume content and you can use Copilot to help you create content. So that's the way I've been kind of thinking about it is, am I in a consumption mode? Am I in a content creation mode uh, whenever I'm using Copilot in my own world? So with teams that's in three different categories from what we have used so far, there's the M365 chat inside of Teams. I find that I use Copilot in Teams the vast majority of the time compared to in the other endpoints because I happen to have teams up on my screen the majority the majority of the day, right? And I'm not switching context. So M365 chat, that surfaces for you as um, sort of a chat bot. It is a bot that you will discuss and have conversations with. It's installed as a Microsoft Teams application. And then you just chat with it like you've been chatting with any other Teams app. It's called M365 chat, unlocks all of that functionality where you can get executive summaries, generate uh, key key actions, ideate with it, you know, talk back and forth, have a very conversational experience. It's also in Microsoft Teams as a group chat or a one-on-one -on -one chat helper. And we'll talk about this in the deep dive into Teams, but you can get context and ask about a specific conversation that you're having. And then what we've seen the most demos of inside of meetings you can supercharge your ability in a meeting if you're transcribing it by invoking Copilot within the meeting. And we'll, we got lots of like videos and little nuggets of information there. Um, <clears throat> with Outlook, it, it really falls into that normal, you know, consume, create type of workflow. You're consuming email, which means you're able to summarize an email thread. You get dumped into a large email thread, you can catch up on it, or you're writing an email you can get Copilot to help you draft and also coach you a little bit in like your tone and your professionalism and things like that. Same thing with Excel, you can analyze the data, you can consume and pull insights, but then you can also take that data and visualize it or turn it into pivot tables, things like that. So again, you're creating something within Excel. Same story with Word, summarizing documents, helping you draft and write documents help you summarize and ask questions of slide decks, help you again draft slides. It's a good starting point to kind of start out with some slides that have content on it. It may not be 100% accurate all the time or the way you would have worded it, but it's a good place to start whenever you're in PowerPoint. So that's kind of the base functionality within M365, the traditional apps of Word, Excel, PowerPoint. Moving out to some of these kind of Mocha apps, right, or more modern collaboration type of apps, inside of OneNote, same deal. You're either summarizing and consuming your notes and getting insights out of like a big brain dump of notes, or you're ideating, you're creating, you know, to-do lists or actions or, you know, sample meeting agendas, stuff like that. Um, whiteboard's a little bit interesting. I think this is what we have probably the least information on, Andy. But um, there's, there's three main core competencies from my experience, and that is that you can, you can create content with your whiteboard. So I don't know where to start. I need a bunch of sticky note ideas. You can say, hey, Copilot, what do I need to know to you know, start our ice cream shop that we're gonna do business planning for? And it just gives you raw content on sticky notes. If you've got a bunch of ideation you've done and you're just literally throwing things at the virtual digital wall and you've got it all messy and unorganized, you can select those notes, you can hit categorize, and then it will find common threads within those sticky notes and give you some common themes and organize those notes for you and kind of group them together. And then one of the neatest things I think of whiteboard with Copilot is that you can summarize a whiteboard. So if you've got this crazy complex whiteboard situation, then uh, you can say, give me a summary. Like, what is this whiteboard telling me? And it creates actually a loop component inside the whiteboard that will give you the key insights, summarize like what, you know, what the whiteboard's talking about, some action items, the whiteboard that it can sense, stuff like that. And I think it's interesting, Daryl probably has a lot to say about this, but when we saw demos of this, we're like, why, why is it like jamming a loop component into it? And my rationalization that I've thought about as I've 
you know, kind of noodled on it a while is I think there's two main reasons. The loop component gives you a rich text area, so it can give you bullets and, you know, headers with bold text and stuff like that. The second thing is it's really powerful to use a loop component because now that is portable and I don't have to share the entire whiteboard in order to share a summary of the whiteboard. I can just share the loop component, you know, standalone. So in, in my explanation or in my experience with Copilot in whiteboard, I've actually like, you know, think that it's, it's a great thing that it tends to be a loop component, gets people exposure to that really cool tool. Same type of thing in loop. You're either creating content, you're summarizing content. Don't want to belabor that too much. And then M365 chat is kind of always there for you as a digital assistant. It's kind of the, the all in one capability, whether you're using it in Microsoft teams in the future, you will use it for, um, in the office.com webpage. So it'll be like, uh, an application in the side menu. And then when you go to bing.com or in the Bing sidebar, you have that, that co-pilot enabled chat assistant for you. So <clears throat> I guess that's everything that, that I've got at a very high level before we deep dive into looking at these specifically and kind of putting a visual to them. Let's go ahead, step Andy. back one slide for just a second. Yeah, sure. Also there want to go. emphasize the order as we're approaching mm -hmm. this and rolling it out for our users, it can be really overwhelming. And part of that mm -hmm. is because some of us have a chat GPT mentality, but some mm -hmm. end users are just trying to figure out what button to push. Where do I start? Like, where, where do I go? Like, um, and it can vary across, you know, roles in the organization, vary across the generations that are represented in the organization, um, the workflow and the type of work that they do. So as you're stepping through this, try to meet the users in the place where it's going to make the most sense for them. And I really like the order that we put this mm -hmm. particular slide uh, in, because from what I'm seeing with some of the conversations around the uh, the users that are implementing it is um, the order here, I think, is is a really good order to keep in mind as you're starting to, to roll this out. Start mm -hmm. with Teams because the meetings feature to be able to have Copilot recap your meeting, to be able to pull out some key takeaways and actionable items for the meeting. That's a very low barrier for entry that provides mm -hmm. a very high uh, return on investment for, uh, for those users. They can get those detailed summaries and notes, and then they can be present in the meeting and not have to worry about scribbling everything down or going back and searching through the transcript later on. Now they can be mm -hmm. present, participate in the meeting, and then go back and have those key points and highlights and be able to talk um, with Copilot against the meeting later. So that's a really good entry point. The group chat, yep. we use this all the time for conversation a uh, one-on-one -on -one or small group that extends into the meetings. So now we're just taking that co-pilot into that summarized meetings for the last seven days. Hey, mm -hmm. I've been talking with this person. Tell me what the action items are over the last two weeks. That can be really helpful. Now you don't have to do that manually. And then the M365 chat, we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But for me, that's really where the value of the whole thing is. That M365 chat is probably, in my opinion, the most powerful co-pilot experience that we have. We'll get mm -hmm. into that more in a little bit. Yeah. But then as you're moving from like one app to another, we're stepping from Teams, which I think is the gateway to Microsoft 365, especially for a lot of the modern workforce because of the fact that meetings sit side by side with conversations, sit side by side mm -hmm. with content. For a lot of information workers, Outlook is still king for communication. So to be able yeah. to go into Outlook and say, okay, summarize this email thread and give me the key takeaway because I'm not reading all that. You know, it's um, too long, didn't read. Uh, that's super, super helpful. And then you start moving into the office applications, Excel, Word, PowerPoint. And that's where um, you're going to really start to hit home with people in certain processes. If I'm in data analytics, Excel, here's the things that you're going to be able to do with it. And we can meet them mm -hmm. where they actually work. So the order that you have here, as uh, I would suggest taking a look at something like this for your organization and figuring out how you're going to be able to meet those end users and show them how Copilot mm -hmm. can help them in their moment of need and then move into other processes as they mature and get more familiar with it. 
Yeah. Yeah. To, to highlight the question, just to answer it up front, like what's your personal favorite way to use Copilot? For me, what I use the most is M365 chat inside of Teams um, because that's where I am the, for the most part. I think the most magical experience is meetings. So if you're an organization that is able to transcribe meetings and you know able to get the benefit of that, um, that that is the magic if you're going to demo this and kind of get you know, like mind blowing functionality right off the bat. But the day to day for me is mostly Microsoft chat because that's where I can kind of keep that conversation going and uh, go back and forth several turns. So that that's my favorite personally. What do you think, Andy? What have you been using the most or? The thing that I like the most <laughs> is the ability to reference files that I have in OneDrive, Teams and SharePoint whether I'm in Word, whether I'm in PowerPoint, whether I'm in mm -hmm. M365 chat, to be able to reference those files and to be able to summarize and consolidate. One of the, the, the demos that I can't wait to be able to show hands-on is creating a, a presentation uh, and being able to reference a mm -hmm. uh, business plan along with a specific customer that I'm that I'm working with in a, ficti a fictitious scenario. But to mm -hmm. be able to reference content and have it automatically consolidate and summarize and um, merge that content together for me, that is, I love that feature. That That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And it, it extends yeah. to a couple of the different co-pilot uh, experiences uh, here. Mm -hmm. Michelle, here's a, a use case that he's talking about is creating three to five points to prepare him for an MTR boot camp. You know, and in his role, he's selling Microsoft Teams room, right? And the latest functionality. He needs to be the latest up-to-date information. So he focuses on emails and meetings just from the last three weeks, right? I don't want out-of-date data. So like putting that that little, you know, almost like constraint on copilot to say i'm looking for the latest data in the last three weeks that's really helpful for him i would say a personal uh the prompt that i like the most so far has been um <laughs> i accidentally did a thumbs up on my camera um the the favorite thing that i have done is um getting executive summaries and project updates so as an architect i'm kind of looking at the bigger picture of like where these different projects are and and what our progress is in different programs so i like asking it to give me an executive summary of a specific project and i don't want just a paragraph of text i want a little summary of what the project is about i want a bulleted list of the key achievements in the past 30 days I want a bulleted list of the issues and challenges that we're running into. And then I want a bulleted list of what has the team said that they're going to work on for the next month, right? I kind of want that like snapshot in time of where where have we been and where are we going? Um, that for me has been just wonderful because I it goes across all of my slide decks, all my emails, all of the meeting updates that I have and um, able to kind of like snapshot that into a project or a program update has been powerful in my role specifically. So um, should we jump into Word? I saw that uh, <clears throat> yeah. Daryl was saying you better get ready for your, <laughs> your intro for Word. <laughs> All right, let's jump in and talk about the first one, which is Copilot in Word. <clears throat> In this 365 deep dive session, we're going to be talking about Copilot in Microsoft Word. So with that, let's go ahead and dive into the features. We've got a short little sizzle reel video here from Microsoft, which over uh, overviews some of the capabilities. And then we're going to talk more about what you're actually seeing here live. So as we dive in, I'm immediately, uh, we're in Microsoft Word and right away, Copilot actually pops up uh, for the user. So you're gonna see this as part of the, uh, the experience. Uh, it's gonna ask you, um, do you wanna get started creating something new and how it can uh, assist? With well, just a simple prompt, a simple um, a request using natural language, it's gonna go ahead and actually start generating content for you. 
you can interact with Copilot while uh, you're in the main document itself, but you're also going to be able to interact with Copilot through the Copilot panel that shows up on mm -hmm. the uh, right hand side of the screen. And you activate that with the Copilot option that is up in the ribbon. Now, this particular video uh, is publicly available. This is from Microsoft's uh, um, uh, website. And notice that the Copilot logo is actually using the logo from a few weeks ago. Uh, it hasn't been updated to reflect the new <laughs> yeah. logo, but it's still the Copilot uh, service. So we got the Copilot panel. Unless I know of another phrase to refer to that as, it's going to be the Copilot panel uh, moving forward. So two different mm -hmm. ways that we're going to be able to interact uh, inside of uh, the presentation. Uh, we yeah. can go ahead and um, walk I, I wanna, through it and we'll talk a little bit more about it. I want to roll back a little bit and point out that this is something that you're going to do a lot in Copilot for Word and PowerPoint, for that matter, and, and chat, is referencing files and people and meetings and things like that. <clears throat> you do that with the slash command. So you'll mm -hmm. do a forward slash to start searching for data. And you can see in this example that they are searching for notes, right? They want a proposal and they want to leverage some notes and they want to mention a roadmap that they already have in Word as well. So being able to pull in right resources to say, okay, the graph is like ridiculous. I want to kind of like narrow it down and narrow my focus to, I know where the good data is. So focus on these items. So I wanted to point that out is you're, you're able to reference things so that you get more relevant results out of that. I'll go ahead and hit play again for you, Andy. So we've created the draft. Now we can use the Copilot panel and we can continue to work with the content that's there. We can continue to build out uh, the actual document. Now we might do some of this by hand. We might go and insert the images that we want by using the insert tab up at the top, but you can actually do that through the Copilot panel along the side. But not only are we able to um, uh, work within that and add content to it, but we can also use that to go back and reformat uh, the content. We can change mm -hmm. the tone. We can change the language that's being used uh, inside the document. We can summarize a complex section, maybe turn it into bullet points so that the readability is uh, uh, easier for uh, whoever's um, going back and reviewing that later. And we can do that through the Copilot panel, but you can also do that in the body of the document as well. If you were to um, add your cursor to the body of the document, a panel is going to pop up and Copilot's going to be available right from there. And it's going to have a Copilot mm -hmm. panel and ask you what you want to, uh, to do. If you highlight existing content inside of there, you can use Copilot to rewrite it or maybe uh, reformat it in a, in a table format uh, if you want. And then in this particular um, screenshot, if you look in the lower uh, right-hand corner, um, we've got the for lack of a better term, we've got the Copilot pixie dust, uh, the Copilot sparkles, <laughs> the Copilot yeah. uh, magic uh, uh, icon. There, we're going to come up with something clever to call that. I'm going to call it the Copilot pixie dust for now, just because that makes me laugh. But yeah, when these diamonds that, mean AI it. to me across every application, not even just Microsoft. If you see those little sparkles, that means like some magic robot is doing something with AI. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. In yeah. a Microsoft world for the longest time, we've joked about, you know, the meatball menu and the waffle icon and the hamburger menu. For me, that's kind of like the salt bay um, mm -hmm. uh, menu uh, right over there because it looks like grains of salt. But uh, we'll it figure does. out a clever food name for it. Uh, that's the magic spice, uh, the essence that we want to add mm -hmm. uh, to this. But when you click on that that menu, it gives you a, a few uh, additional commands that, uh, that you're going to be able to uh, to work with. So as you're as you're working on the document, the 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 biggest thing is all the way back at the very beginning, mm -hmm. Copilot can get you over the blank page. It can help you start from something that is existing, the content that you've already collected, whether it's an uh, email in Outlook, whether it's notes in your OneNote, whether it's a document mm -hmm. that you previously drafted. And the last thing I want to point out about that is that the content needs to be in the Microsoft ecosystem. It needs to be in OneDrive, Teams, SharePoint, and Outlook in order for um, Copilot to be able to go back and, and find it. 
And then you've got a starting point where you can draw inspiration and then massage it and through the co-pilot panel and even in the body of the document, be able to, to work with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Daryl has a question here. That's wait a second. Is the panel going to pop up every time I put my cursor <laughs> next to text? Um, to answer that, that is not going to happen. So it's not going to be constantly like coming out, going away, coming out, going clippy. away. <laughs> no, what what he means is when you put your cursor like over here next to it in that white space, you're going to see a co-pilot icon right there that you can click on and it will open up like an intelligent thing where if you had text selected, the little co-pilot icon in the left-hand side is going to say, do you want to summarize? Do you want to rewrite this? It's going to give you like that type of thing. If you put it in empty space, then when you click on the, the co-pilot icon, it's going to ask you what you want to draft content in that white space. So it's not going to, you know, be like constantly coming up and, and moving your view around. It's a little like kind of like a little helper in the side. Now that's for the side panel in the body like mm -hmm. if you go back to the beginning of the document the beginning of the video uh -huh. there yeah that thing right there if you mm -hmm. click into um like outside of a paragraph and you click into the the white space of the body itself that does tend to pop up um when the cursor engages with uh, with the document so this mm -hmm. thing right here you'll see it when the document first opens up and then if you go into the like the white space between like the pricing paragraph and then the, mm -hmm. the topic down below it um it does pop up there as well yeah you see like at the bottom that's one other thing to point out um can you go back to that uh, that part where it said keep it mm -hmm. yeah, yeah so right, right, right there once it generates something you have the option to keep it they've even updated this a little bit to adjust it to regenerate and what I'm seeing mm -hmm. now is it actually gives you a couple of different drafts to review. So if you've got like a small paragraph, it'll give you two or three different versions of that for you to kind of pick and choose what you want. Yeah. Ugh. And back. full disclaimer, you should pay attention to the actual content that's there and check it for accuracy. Mm -hmm. They will put that all over the product. You'll see it everywhere, but you need to verify that the content is actually what you're looking for. Uh, and it's being generated um, with the message that you're actually trying to send there. So don't just depend on it. Make sure you fact check it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's look at the slides that we have about this here. So to recap that a little bit, um, you can draft content, you can adjust or kind of augment your content to make it a little bit better, kind of, you know, massage it a little bit. Like, I don't want this i want it in a different format like bullet points or a table or something like that you can create that way and then where's some other pictures here so this shows summarizing the content and now this is yeah so this must be um, a more up-to-date you got the new yeah. icon right there but yeah if you open up a document that's already been created you can just consume it as you normally would or if you invoke that copilot pane on the right hand side, then you can ask it to summarize. And this summarization is like one of those pre provided prompts for you. You'll see it up here at the top as a suggestion. Or if you click the sparkle down at the bottom, it, one of those like recommended prompts will, uh, will tell you, hey, do you want to summarize this? You click summarize and it starts giving you those main ideas. It formats it nicely in some bullet points, it's kind of easy to skim. You also can give it more detail. If you say, summarize this document and you know, give me the top 10 things or the top five things, you can give it a little bit more coaching. That's, that's called prompt engineering, where you can sell it, tell it what format you want, how much of it you want, things like that. Um, something that, that I'm kind of honing in on like my own little analogy of what prompt engineering is like for me and <clears throat> i i like to describe prompt engineering like this i have three kids at home three small children if i tell them to unload the dishwasher and i just say that they're going to do who knows what with the dishes right they're going to just pull out the dishes and leave them on the counter for all i know or leave them on the floor so what i've got to do is say uh, please unload the dishwasher and put the plates in the cabinet above the sink 
put the uh the the silverware in the silverware drawer i need you to separate the silverware by forks spoons and knives you got to give that level of detail sometimes when you're talking to generative ai you want to tell it exactly what you want to do and don't assume that it can just infer what you want based off of a short like ah summarize this chances are you're going to get a better output if you give it a, a more clear definition of what you want so uh, summarize this document could be a little bit dangerous because you might want something a little bit different keep in mind you can add that to your prompt as well so along those lines microsoft does have some publicly available information around some of the prompting guidelines yeah. and the four main things that they're recommending is you give it a goal what do you expect from copilot you provide a little mm -hmm. bit of context you give it a source what should it pull from and then you set the expectations you need to think of it as a conversation and know the first time you ask it for something is not necessarily the end result that you actually want. So you say mm -hmm. summarize this document, we get four bullet points, but those four bullet points might not be all encompassing or they might be a little wordy. So then you could say, OK, summarize this documents and be a little bit more concise with the mm -hmm. response or um, divide it up into a couple of subtopics and you're yeah. you're going to be conversing against it to to get those uh, those responses back. Yeah, I want to share this a little bit. We'll put this <clears throat> this in the the um, chat. But uh, at Work Lab, they had the art and science of working with AI. This is what Andy was talking about. Is this kind of like anatomy of a prompt? Start with the end in mind, then moving on, set the stage, give it that context that it, that you're looking for. That could be referencing a file or something like that, or referencing a person, then define the parameters, tell it like, you know, what samples or, you know, use this for inspiration, stuff like that. And then tailor how you want it to be. I want this as a table. I want this as bullet points with headers, things like that. So this can really help you kind of like generate those good responses or those, those good prompts. I'll put that in the chat for you guys. Yes, Work Lab rocks. <laughs> I love the Work Lab. Um, definitely subscribe to that podcast and the RSS for that um, because they have some gold in those pro, uh, posts. So, yeah, Copilot is like a six to 10 year old child. Um, you have to act like you're, you know, giving it, giving it very specific instructions about what you want. <laughs> so, uh, we might have gotten ahead of ourselves a little bit as get diving into prompt engineering and things yeah. like that. So, what well, else do we want to talk also, about uh, here? That's also something to, to keep in mind. There are guardrails mm -hmm. against that you need to stay within. Rather, there are guardrails you need to stay within. Mm -hmm. uh, you can you can try to do the type of prompt engineering that you see people doing on social media. It's not going to work uh, necessarily here in the in the Microsoft Copilot world. There are things that. Mm -hmm that it can do and can't do. We'll show you the service description in, in just a moment. But what you see here are some core capabilities. Help me to get started. Create something from something that's already existing. Consolidate a few mm -hmm. things, merge them together. Give me something to work with from there. Summarize this document. Summarize with bullet points. Make more concise. Rewrite this section. Make it more uh, readable. Those are the things that it uh, does really well. And those are the things that it excels at today. And it's a service that's very much in its infancy and it's going to grow. So if you approach it like that, if you approach it like you're talking to a six-year-old and you set those expectations, then you're going to have a lot of success in, uh, in working with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here is the service description from Microsoft Learn or learn.microsoft.com. And we'll, again, we'll put the link for this in the chat too. Um, but you're able to write and summarize, get drafts, draft content. Remember, it can be usefully wrong. So, you know, you need to verify for accuracy, things like that. Um, it can uh, add context so it can rewrite things. It can expand upon ideas, summarize documents for you, um, stuff like that. It can understand the tone of it if it's, you know, more casual, more professional, something like that. And then, um, you know, you can... 
you can kind of like play devil's advocate with it a little bit, you know, and say, you know, what am I missing here? Or, uh, you know, give me a contrarian's perspective on what this document is talking about. You can kind of like role play with it a little bit as well, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> okay. Copilot in Excel. So in this section of 365 Deep Dive, we're going to be talking about Copilot in Microsoft Excel. Oh, let me mute So that. as we begin our Excel journey, I think one of the things that it's important to point out is that it's going to work with table formatted data. That's where you're really going to get the, the best Excel experience out of it. So working with table-based uh, data inside of there. Much like we saw in Copilot for Word, in Copilot for Excel, we've got the Copilot panel that opens up along the side that allows us to interact with the data uh, inside of the, uh, the workbook. As far as the capabilities here, um, you're going to be able to do things like have it to identify insights. It's actually really good at doing that, um, breaking down insights in that, table, uh, in that table and identifying trends that you might not immediately see um, just parsing through uh, raw, raw numbers. You're mm -hmm. going to be able to have it work with things like timeframes. So, for example, one of the things in the sidebar you see over there is change from quarters to months. It can do things like that really, really quickly versus if you were mm -hmm. to try to do some of that, um, it would be much more uh, timely uh, or time consuming rather uh, for you to be able to do that. And then once it starts interacting with that data, you're going to be able to do things like insert visualizations, charts of varying kinds. And I think what they've done a really good job of is working with um, the um, machine learning and analytics on the back end from years and years of experience working with Excel. And it knows intelligently what format um, to present that data back to you in, in a visualization. It knows um, how to help you conditionally format data because it's got all those years of learning on the on the back end, all, all of those best practices. Uh, for years, I've referred to um, there's a couple mm -hmm. of visualization guides that Microsoft has that are really good. I've presented those in, or shared those in trainings. And this is going to do a lot of that for you. And so you don't necessarily have to go and find that style guide uh, to do that. And it's really going to help uh, with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, three things that I think is really cool about Copilot in Excel. And I have to admit, I am not an Excel power user. I don't use it very often. I kind of use it begrudgingly when I have to, to be honest. Um, I know people, especially in my organization, would be like, what, Excel isn't the most amazing tool you've ever used? Because uh, we're in a huge Excel shop. But um, three things that I think are great are one, getting visualizations that I may not know how to do because I don't use Excel that much getting visualizations and getting pivot tables because I always have to like look up a YouTube video about how to make a pivot table because I do it so infrequently. So that would be like the first thing is doing things in Excel. I don't know how to, how to do. The second one is getting those visualizations or being able to do that conditional formatting. You can see right here where it's doing, I'm going to pause that. It's doing a color coding visualization that I could do that myself, but again, it's going to speed that up a little bit. And then that third thing, which is creating a model like, okay, I've got the data from what happened last year. What if I made this one little change? What might it look like next year? Being able to kind of like role play or like forecast and do things like that, I think is really, really powerful because you can see theoretically, what if I made this change or that change to my strategy? How does that affect the numbers for me? So I think that's a really cool ability right there to be able to kind of look into the future a little bit and, um, you know, kind of have that safe place to do some modeling, stuff like that. So um, those are my three favorite things in Excel. Andy, have you used Excel Copilot all that much before? <laughs> Or are you kind of in the I, same boat as me? 
I'll tell you one of the things that I have used it for, and this is really helpful for me, and that's working with formulas and expressions. It's actually really mm -hmm. helpful for, for working with some of that. Um, full disclosure, um, I've used it with my fantasy baseball league and my fantasy football league. Uh, as we were getting toward the playoffs in the fantasy baseball league, that was helping me to identify trends over the last like nice. um, three to six weeks, which in some services is not always available. So I was able to pull it giving in. you a leg up. You yeah, think? exactly. Um, <laughs> like when like I play in ESPN leagues and those leagues, it gives mm -hmm. you a total score, but it doesn't break it down like in baseball of um, batting um, uh, scoring versus like pitching statistics. It just puts it into one big bucket. And I needed to be able to break that up into two buckets. I wanted to know hitting wise how I was doing and then pitching wise how I was doing. Uh, compared to the rest of the league. So I was able to mm -hmm. um, create an Excel workbook and import the standings. And the standings actually had all the information for hitters and for pitchers in, in one table. So I put that mm -hmm. in one table and, and then it had the total column. And then I created a second table side by side with that and I inputted our scoring metrics. And then I was able to get Copilot to help me to, um, based off of the scoring metrics, create uh, score um, scoring that broke down hitting versus pitching and then i was able to see okay hitting wise how do i compare to some of the other teams and pitching wise how do i compare to some of the other teams and then i was able to gain a little bit more insight into that that was a fun experiment for me and it was helping me to create and generate some of those formulas and expressions which in this case we're talking we, we do um, I think we have eight hitting categories and seven or eight um, uh, uh, pitching categories, and each one's weighed a little bit differently or weighted a little bit differently. It was able to help me to to do that um, with an it's kind of a nested formula, and so it it got pretty complex. So it was able to help me figure that out and the syntax along with it, and that was that was really cool. Yeah. Okay, so to kind of you know break down what. Excel Copilot or Copilot in Excel is kind of the the branding that you're going with at this time. It's um, some ideas are breaking down sales by channel. You know, asking questions about your data. You know, what are the key trends? What are the things that that you think are contributing to you know an increase in sales, a decrease in sales, whatever um, stuff like that. Reformatting the data into other visuals. That's something that, that has been helpful to me over the past couple months, you know, here and there, creating charts that you may not know necessarily how to create or kind of like a pain in the neck to create. You can ask it to create those for you. And you can also have it, you know, tell you what is the best way to visualize this data. Um, that's something I struggle with is like, should this be a bar chart or should this be a line graph or a pie chart? You know, um, Copilot kind of kind of help you with like the best way to visualize as well, which is pretty cool. Um, the feature description for this, again, from learn.microsoft.com, is um, that you can query data in natural language. You don't have to, you know, think in terms of formulas. You can uh, reveal those like insights, correlations, do those what if scenarios, that kind of modeling that I talked about, uh, generating models based on questions. What if I change this? What if I change that? How does it affect the data? Um, and then again, create those visualizations, ask for recommendations, stuff like that. So um, anything else? Uh, let's see here. Fairy Geek Mother has a question that is, for those with licenses, will Copilot replace the current functionality like data in Excel, designer, stuff like that? From what I've seen, no, it doesn't replace any of those other features. Um, my, like PowerPoint designer, it, it kind of augments PowerPoint designer for me, right? Um, I can do PowerPoint designer without Copilot, or I can ask Copilot to draft some slides for me, and it leverages designer as kind of its engine to create the layout. So I haven't seen anywhere where it's going to replace functionality. I've just seen where it's going to add to it. Yeah, and it's, I, I, I would second that it doesn't take anything away from the application it just gives you a new way to interact with those features and those functionalities using the mm -hmm. copilot tool and natural language uh, sometimes it's easier for a user to say hey can you just highlight all of these things that are above mm -hmm. this threshold in green versus trying to figure out how to do the formula if you know how to do it you can still go in there and do it this just gives you a way to ask it uh, to do that 
uh, uh, without having to have all of that uh, in-depth uh, in-depth knowledge. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. All right, you ready to move on? Uh, one. I think we got hold on. There's one more down there. Let me just read that real quick. This is oh, Daryl. Yeah, Daryl, I agree. I don't have the skill to <laughs> to fact check a lot of the numbers either to understand. You know, is like, is it hallucinating or not? Um, that's something where like you. This isn't going to replace people, right? Like you need to have the skills to know if it is going wildly out of bounds or not. Um, you need to understand the data. Like going back to Microsoft Word, draft me something um, about a topic. I need to understand that topic enough to know if it's giving me nonsense or not. You know, so like you still have to have these these soft skills and understand what you're doing and not just fully trust it uh, to do that. So that's a good thing to point out, Daryl, for yep. sure. Okay, so why don't we move into an app that we're more familiar with? Uh, I use PowerPoint all day, every day. I feel like I live in PowerPoint. So this is more in our wheelhouse a little bit. I'll go ahead and hit play for us. So in this section, we're gonna be talking about Copilot in Microsoft PowerPoint. Copilot in PowerPoint is going to help you get over the blank slide starting point. You can actually go in and start generating a presentation based off of an existing document. So, for example, if you have a proposal that you've already drawn up, the Copilot application is going to be able to go ahead and start building out a PowerPoint presentation for you, uh, including a number of uh, different slides content within those slides based off of the document that it's pulling in from but it's also going to try to intelligently add um, a theme to that as well as visualizations to support that now this is the starting point this is to show you the art of what is possible you don't have to leave it in the form that it actually uh, gives it to you um but taking that that deck and having eight or 10 slides to start from gets you over that initial barrier. And then it's just a matter of let's clean it up and polish it. Let's add in the information that we want and then start to visualize it. Mm -hmm. But I think we both know that when we are deeply invested in the world of PowerPoint, we want a whole lot of control over everything from the theme to the visualizations to the fonts, to the way that that information is presented to the storytelling aspect of that they try to implement some of that um, based off of all of the research and all of the telemetry that the uh, PowerPoint engineering teams have. So this is that starting point, but it is possible to do more. So when you're in here, you're going to be able to use the co-pilot panel to do things like add an additional slide. And not only can you tell it to add a slide, but you can tell it to go ahead and populate it with content, add a slide about this specific topic, and go mm -hmm. ahead and drop that into my presentation. Or this slide is too wordy. Can you make it less wordy? Can you make it unlike Andy and get to the point? Uh, can you insert this image or replace this image with another uh, image? Can you copy the style from a previous presentation and go ahead and add that? And one other thing I want to point out on this particular part of the video as well, it will populate your notes. Uh, um, uh, mm -hmm as it's building it. And I think that's really helpful, especially if you deliver presentations and you use the notes uh, feed uh, inside of there. So not only will it build that, our, uh, that presentation and get you started, but it mm -hmm. will also populate the notes uh, as well for the, for the speakers. So those things are, are, are really, really cool. Now, um, John, what's your experience like as you've been working with, uh, mm -hmm. with PowerPoint and generating some content there? Yeah. So, for me, I think what a lot of people are going to really like about Copilot in PowerPoint is this initial area. I don't think it's going to make all of us lazy slide designers because from what I've seen, um, I think a lot of people are going to get the output and be like, ah, maybe I'll tweak this or tweak that, or maybe it's not quite the image that I was looking for or something like that because you have in your mind the story that you want to tell, right? And I think it's going to take some repetitions and some expertise experience to uh, to get what is in your mind, the story you want to tell 
into a prompt that gets you what you want. I think this is where prompt engineering is going to be one of those like mastery level skills whenever you come to PowerPoint. But I think the immediate benefit is starting with a blank slide deck and saying, hey, co-pilot, I need to give a talk about this subject and I want to make sure that I hit these points, but I don't really know like the flow of what I want to do. Copilot, I think, is going to really help with giving you the structure of what your talk should be about. You know, if you kind of don't know where to start, I usually start out with an outline, and that's probably what takes the most amount of time, in my opinion, to create a presentation is what do I want to talk about and what order do I want to talk about it? And Copilot, what I've seen is that it helps kind of like fast track that ordering of things for me to where I may just make small tweaks, but generally kind of accept like, oh, I like that flow. Um, then I go slide by slide and make it, you know, my, my story, my vision, my visuals, things like that. So Daryl has a question here that's, is it going to respect the corporate template? At least right now, from what I've seen, no, it uses those PowerPoint designer type of templates where it's going to say, Hey, here's some, what designer says is beneficial for you. Um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to, you know, get a little bit more like, uh, I have an organizational asset library. I want to use these pictures. I want to use those. Um, right now, no, it's about what you get from PowerPoint designer. I don't know, Andy, if you know more about the public roadmap and where they're headed with that. Um, my organization, we don't have the the org asset library set up yet, so we haven't been able to experience that if it's possible. Yeah, I don't have any any more information on um, organizational templates and look and feel to add to the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to point out, though, um, as, you know, kind of on this this same lines, um, big picture what mm -hmm. what's it going to do so you can create a new presentation as we see here it does try to build it and you know, use the designer tool to to give it a, a certain look and feel one of mm -hmm. the things that i think is really cool is in the side panel over there it can summarize the entire thing so like we we mm -hmm. we talked about it from hey here's an outline or a proposal that i had over here as a word document um, generate a presentation, but it can also go the other way. You can go in and say, summarize this presentation and mm -hmm. give me, um, you know, bullet points around these 30 slides that are, uh, that are in it. And I think that's actually really, really helpful, especially for like larger decks. Yeah. Or like I'm going back to review something later. That could be an outline that maybe I turn into a blog post, or maybe I turn into a proposal, or maybe I turn into a longer form document. But it can also help you to mm -hmm. organize the presentation. You can have it to um, organize and reorganize and um, move the slides um, around. And then you can go back and you can polish it by having it do use designer, create some themes, help you with mm -hmm. some images, change some images around um, and, uh, and work with it. What I like to see is to be able to go in and use things like um, Bing chat and the uh, Dolly three integration and have it generate images and put those in the body of the presentation. I think that would be a really cool feature and I'd like to be able to do that in the future. Um, so that would be really cool um, to see something like that. But um, from the from the content uh, generation um, piece and to go back to um, to Daryl's mm -hmm. question, I don't have any specific information around whether organizational templates are going to be respected. I think they would, but that mm -hmm. might be something that's going to be a little bit further down the road. Yeah. Pete mentioned also the new brand center that's been talked about that might have an <clears> impact <throat> too. That might, that might be something that aligns more with like they kind of intersect at the same time. So it, it may leverage that a little bit more than kind of the mm -hmm. way it's been done traditionally. Um, I, I don't know. I don't have insight into that yet. Um, I suspect that, we're going to see some announcements coming out over the coming months about some of these things that that answer some of those questions like Daryl mentioned, like, eh, yeah, but can I do this or can I do that specific thing? I bet we're going to see a lot of kind of follow on announcements that, that might address some of those things. I really like this idea from Daryl that was imagine the um, the uh, coach, the presenter coach, presentation coach, like imagine that not only giving you scores and what you, you know, things like your pace and filler words and stuff like that, but what if it knows the content enough that it can also give you, 
you know, tips about what you missed or what you spent too much time on something like that. I, I haven't heard anything at all about how the coach might get better, but I'm just throwing that out into the universe. If somebody from Microsoft ever sees that, um, more AI powered coaching, that's a really cool idea from Daryl here about, you know, adding notes and stuff like that would be really cool output to kind of like make your presentation better rather than just scoring you on your delivery. We heard it here first, folks. Copilot coach Daryl was the one that threw that idea out there. Yeah, I, million I do dollar think idea. That would actually be really cool. <laughs> yeah. As far as um, from a service description um, uh, standpoint, you can transform written documents into the decks, and as we saw, speaker notes and sources. That's all really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to expand on that a little bit, though. Um, we're, we'll talk more about this in a bit, but like we were in Word a little while ago and we talked about referencing other files. One of the things that I've done in Word that's been really fun is to reference other files and say, hey, take this um, this uh, uh, business summary that I'm working on and take this pitch deck that I created and combine that into a single document. So um, uh, the fourth coffee shop deck that Microsoft has out there, it's just a template. I took that and combined it with a generic uh, business uh, plan and it took those two things and built out a business plan and a reference fourth coffee within it so if you've got a pitch deck mm -hmm. you can kind of use it going in the other direction and i just thought that was really cool we saw it here from word coming into powerpoint but it can also go the other way which i think is really neat um yeah. we we saw you can create a new presentation from a prompter outline you can condense presentations um that's really neat you kind of have to experiment with that a little bit um, and then not only with condensing presentations, I do want to expand on that. You can have it uh, get rid of some of the wordiness within a, a specific slide. You can use it to condense that, turn it into a series of bullet points that's a little bit easier to read. Now, is that going to be like PowerPoint story best practice? Probably not. It still needs that person to be able to, to parse through that. Um, but it can condense down wordy slides and it can make it something that's more approachable for the users. And then using the natural language commands to adjust the layouts, reformat the text and then work with things like um, animations. I haven't seen the time animations. I experimented with that a little bit and I didn't get any kind of results with that. It told me that it wasn't possible to work with like animations. So maybe the timing something I need to go in and, uh, and play around with. But I did mm -hmm. like being able to use natural language. I've heard it's um, it's been said that users only use a small percentage of the total number of features that are actually built into PowerPoint. There's hundreds of features there, and most end users only use a few of them. And even as a, I, I would consider myself a PowerPoint power user. I use the mess out of it, uh, and I try mm -hmm. to do some really cool things with it. I think beyond you know really what it was designed for. Um, sometimes I don't know where the menu is to find that command. It's, you know, it's, it's buried down deep somewhere. And so being able to just go to Copilot and say, Hey, I'm trying to do this and have it work with me. That's going to save a whole lot of time. And I think it's also going to help a lot of users, uh, to approach PowerPoint, um, and, and do some more advanced things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another thing to not, you know, skip over as well is this isn't listed in here yet. But um, just that summarization as well. It, the service description kind of focuses a lot on, uh, on like creating mm -hmm. stuff. But if you get sent a slide deck that is just like a hundred slides, you don't know what to do with it. Make sense of it. You can ask questions of your slide decks, and you can yeah. you know say, what is this about? What are the key themes? What do I need to do about it? Why should I care? Those types of things. Um, Copilot is great about that for things that are sent to you. So again, kind of that, am I creating or am I consuming? Think of those kind of two C words whenever you're dealing with Copilot. So cool. Um, all right, moving on. Let's talk about email. We're getting into more of the collaboration uh, aspects of things. So in this section, we're going to be talking about Copilot in Microsoft Outlook. With Copilot and Outlook, you're going to be able to start drafting a response to uh, a message inside of your inbox. You're also going to be able to draft a new message uh, right from there. 
Additionally, some of the really cool features is to be able to catch up on a conversation. So maybe there's a threaded conversation going back and forth amongst some teammates. You're going to be able to use Copilot to go and get you caught up on that conversation to identify key takeaways and action items inside of there and to summarize that into something that's a little bit more uh, digestible. Um, additionally, mm -hmm. it's going to present it back to you in, in a couple of different formats, um, and you're going to be able to kind of pick not only um, how you want to see it, but if you're generating a response, you're also going to be able to provide some parameters around that. For example, being able to determine whether your response is going to be short, medium, or long form, but also the type of the, the tone that you want to respond back with. That mm -hmm. being said, as we're looking at this, I'm not sure that my boss wants me to respond in the format of a poem. I'll try it <laughs> and I'll let you know how I it have goes. done it a couple times. <laughs> Create a haiku about, you know, what I did this week and, you know, the key takeaways. <laughs> um, we'll see how that uh, how that lands in the organization. Um, I think that will be more for maybe some fun uh, interacting uh, within that within the team. But to be able yeah. to change the tone and the writing style, I think that's something that carries across Copilot, not only in, mm -hmm. in Outlook, but across all the various Copilot services to be able to identify a certain tone and how you want to be able to to, uh, uh, to respond. Now, something that was announced in this writing style area is at the Surface launch event in at the end of September. Uh, Microsoft announced that they're adding another option to this in the future. We haven't seen it yet. It's not available in the EAP, but um, that's going to be an option called Sound Like Me, where Copilot is going to understand the way that you speak and kind of what your voice is in email, the way that you sign off, what your nickname for yourself is, things like that. Uh, and it will sound more like you. So I'm interested to see what that looks because uh, to be honest, they're a little bit generic. You know, it's a little bit of like what you would get out of like Bing chat or something like that. If you've played with answering emails with Bing chat, um, I think it's going to get a lot more real realistic sounding when we have that sound like me option, I kind of hope that that is the default when it rolls out, but I haven't, I haven't seen either way. I'm really interested to test that feature because I've done some of that with chat GPT, given it some samples of my writing. I've even given it some samples, a transcript of a presentation that I delivered and asked it mm -hmm. to do some text analysis. I'm really interested to see how the sound like me uh, compares yeah. to some of the other uh, tools uh, for this that I think it's going to be a lot of fun um, to test out. Yeah. So Daryl has a question here that's like, <clears throat> is that going to add to the LLM or something? Um, from a technical perspe perspective, the way I understand it, absolutely not. Um, the LLM does not learn from anything that users send to the system. So it doesn't learn from, it doesn't retain any of that information. From what I understand, it's going to leverage the graph and it's going to understand how you speak and what your mannerisms are, things like that from uh, from the graph. And I think it's going to augment your prompt with that. So it's going to be the, the behind the scenes prompt will be something like reply by saying this, make it a short thing, th uh, use this voice where they say, these things a lot and you know here's kind of the tone that they use i think it's going to kind of inject that stuff uh based off of what i believe to be probably the um the semantic index so to roll back like four months when we talked to jeremy chapman there's an organizational semantic index and then there's your semantic index so what i could imagine is is that at most potentially how you sound might be part of your own semantic index and then leveraged. But uh, I would imagine it's either doing that or it's just adding it almost as like custom instructions to the prompt itself. But it's not going to learn from and retain that all of your employees sound like all of these different people. Uh, that's not gonna be part of the LLM itself. So that leads me to Pete's question of like, can I sound like someone else? Um, one, I don't think Microsoft's going to give you a button to do that because I think that would fall afoul of their responsible AI. But um, at least in your organization, if the LLM doesn't learn what people sound like, you're not going to be able to say, I want to sound like my director, you know, because it's not going to, 
you know, I, I don't think it's going to know it. Hopefully it will catch that from a responsible AI perspective. Cause now, I was reading you don't Pete's mimic question people. is, can I make it sound like Pete the pirate and respond in that voice? I would like to test that as well. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to do <laughs> yeah. that. So I'll report back and let you know how the yeah. Pete the pirate voice comes out. Yeah. That could be a little bit of uh, red teaming that you do in your organization as well. It's like, I want to sound like my peer over here. And see if it's like, oh, well, yeah, that person uses a bunch of, you know, things that, you know, that may come out, may come across as like bias or something like that. That's something to watch for. So. So we have yeah, guidelines in our organizations for our email signatures. <laughs> I think we're going to have some guidelines around the sound like uh -huh. me uh, replies in, uh, uh, in Outlook. Yeah, this is great. Sound like me is a little bit scary. Credential hacks, things like that. If you do MFA, go passwordless. You don't have to worry about that quite as much. But yeah, um, that's another thing. Like, is phishing going to get incredibly good with general AI, generative AI? That's that's a not co-pilot to topic, but you know, it's kind of an interesting thing to wonder about. Like, oh my gosh, is phishing going to get really good because it's going to actually sound like a person more than it does today? So. Moving into some of those uh, those details there. So you can see this is, whoops, I meant to, to pause that. You can see that this is that initial draft of starting a new email. You get again that ribbon kind of similar to Microsoft Word where you can say, this is what I wanna say. This is kind of how I wanna say it. And then it gives you that. Um, and you can adjust the tone whenever it generates. You'll see here in a second that you can adjust that and you can regenerate, try again, yeah. stuff like that. So that's what the generating content looks like. Um, and then this here, this is that catch up with Copilot. So this is not something that I've seen yet uh, in, in my own experience. Um, what I've seen or what, what we have available to us at GA is going to be the ability to get a summary of a thread specifically. So if you get, I always get, you know, added to like a 35 email chain all of a sudden at like three o'clock in the morning, my time, and I wake up like, what in the world is this? You can get a summary of that. That's what the like out of the box uh, right away capabilities is going to be is replying to emails, getting summaries, generating drafts of brand new content. And we'll let that play out a little bit right there so um i haven't seen yet the ability to flag items or um you know get get like catch me up on my email from the past week stuff like that that type of task we'll get into with m365 chat i have used the chat to catch me up on things that are in my mailbox but i just haven't done it in outlook quite yet um anything you want to add andy to this uh, service description <laughs> So um, with the service description, I, I think one thing to kind of point out is that um, there are a couple of different Outlook clients out there. There's the classic Outlook mm, client yeah. uh, for desktop. There's the modern Outlook client for desktop, which is also very similar to Outlook for the web, uh, OWA, OWA. And mm -hmm. um, the experience is going to vary and it's going to be heavily weighted toward the modern clients. Uh, so keep mm -hmm. that in mind as you're, as you're working with this. Um, if you're using maybe a classic desktop version of Outlook, you're not necessarily going to see uh, um, Copilot uh, anytime soon yeah. uh, with that. Yeah. If you are someone who's more web inclined, you're more likely to be able to, uh, to work with it. Um, and then from there, I think some of the key takeaways, um, you know, Feature-wise, the users um, should be excited about, but also temper those expectations. Is the summary is only going to go back so far? Um, I can't recall exactly how long, how many days back, or how many replies back that the summary for email uh, is going to go. I have to double check on the service descriptions with that, but it's not necessarily going to crawl your inbox for the last three years. Um, it's going to mm -hmm. be limited um, to a, to a certain time frame. Um, the ability to respond to an email quickly with a single prompt is great, but there's a meme floating around and it's like, Hey, you know, I got to draft this email. I'm going to use, you know, Copilot to do it. And then somebody gets the email on the other end and they're like, Oh, 
yeah, they wrote this with Copilot. So um, give me a summary and then reply with Copilot. Um, and then you just got, you know, Copilots responding to one another and taking the yeah. person out of the equation. Um, the robots talking to robots. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. fact check it, actually read and engage it. Um, but it is helpful to, hey, this is a long email thread. Summarize it and tell me what the key bullet points are. And then, you know, ask it a couple of follow up questions and, and get down um, into it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, you know, have some fun with it. But keep in mind, we use this for, uh, in many cases for professional communication. Um, and I think it's really important to set that standard. Yeah. Personally, I have used the summarization of email threads like crazy. That has been like a superpower for me. Um, to understand long email chains, but I have almost not used the generating drafts at all um, because really like I, I want to say things in my own voice. I want to, I want to be me, you know, whenever I respond. So I think sound like me might change that for me personally, but um, I, I've gotten a lot of use out of summarization, not quite so mu much use out of generating uh, things, but again, also with chat GPT or Bard, like Gmail, I haven't been doing that in other apps either as well. So that's just, uh, I guess, uh, I'm, maybe I'm old school or something and that like I like to write my communications, but uh, that's just a little bit of my own experience. So, okay. Oh boy, you ready to talk teams? This is where there's lots of teams, thanks. <laughs> Hope you guys are ready. Here goes a deep yeah. dive. This is a very exciting part too, though. So. All right. So in this section, we're going to be talking about Copilot and Microsoft Teams. Now, Copilot and Teams actually has a few different experiences, whether you're working in chat in a small group one to one or a small group. Um, but it's also going to extend into things like your meetings. And that's going to apply to private meetings as well as the channel meetings that you're going to be working with. And even then, Copilot's going to extend into uh, the M365 Copilot is kind of the virtual assistant. So you're going to see a bunch of different Copilot experiences um, along the way. So some of the core entry points are going to be able to go in and have it work with things like meeting notes that you've generated. And Daryl's really going to love this because it is overlapping with Loop. So the Copilot and Loop and being able to interact with those Loop notes that you've mm -hmm. created. So we're going to see... Um, Copilot, uh, as part of the meeting notes experience, being able to prompt against or query against the, the meeting notes that were actually generated, identifying those action points and creating new content. But you're also going to be able to use it to do things like summarize the chat and conversation history. You're going to be able to have it go in and catch you up on a meeting that maybe you got to just a few minutes late recap the meeting so far so you can see what the key points are, find any actionable items inside of that meeting, and then at the end, generate the meeting notes um, for the attendees of those meetings. And that's going to have details, it's going to have actionable items, and it's going to have key takeaways. And you're going to be able to take that information and pass it forward. So users can be attendees can be more engaged in the meeting and not necessarily um, concentrating on getting down the key points and maybe missing a key point uh, while they're jotting mm -hmm. something down. So they're going to be present in the meeting uh, versus uh, having to be the meeting stenographer. Now we have that and it's co-pilot. But there's a lot in this video to, to take away. So let's go back and step through some of the, the various yeah. scenes that we saw here. Yeah, so some of the things here are are showing like the recap. So I would say that if you want to look at the whole life of a meeting, you should think in terms of before, during, and after. What this video doesn't cover is the before side of it. I think that's more of a like a loop co-pilot thing. Like I need some ideas for an agenda, you know, stuff like that. Write me an agenda for the meeting. Um, but we shouldn't just forget about the before. What I want to focus on though is the during and the after. They're showing here the after, and this is one, one thing that I can put on the hat of like a global organization. You can't make every single meeting. Sometimes it's just at night or early in the morning or something like that, or heaven forbid we have a conflict. I always have conflicts. Well, if the other people in the meeting are so kind 
as to record the meeting for you, run the transcription for you, you will be able to get the, the transcript. You'll be able to go into Copilot on the side right here and ask about the meeting, get a summary, get the key takeaways, stuff like that. So I do want to point out though, that we're looking at two different things on the screen right now. The first is all of this right here, where it created topics for you. It knows the speakers. It knows the automatically generated notes, not manually generated. This part of the window is Teams Premium, right? So this is what you get for $10 extra per month. If you don't have Teams Premium, you can still use Copilot and the transcript to generate notes, to do things. It's just not gonna be quite as like done for you and in this pretty format. So I do wanna kind of set expectation right there. If you're not a premium organization, you won't get a lot of this type of stuff. But if you have Copilot, you'll still be able to open up Copilot for the meeting and say, what did I miss? What were the action items? That type of stuff. And it's going to use the transcript for that. So you don't, you don't get nothing if you're not premium. You just, you know, you're going to do it conversationally with Copilot. So I do kind of want to point that out. Um, um, so that's we, after the meeting. Before we exit out of there, can we go back go ahead. for just a second? Yeah. One other key takeaway, and this is this is really a key difference. Notice that uh, up at the top, it's chat, details, files, and recap. Mm -hmm. This tells me that we're in a private meeting. This was a meeting that was scheduled maybe from the Teams calendar or maybe from chat with a small group, or perhaps it was scheduled from uh, Outlook. So this is a uh, private meeting. The private meeting has that recap tab along the top. That recap mm -hmm. tab um, will show you, in this case, the Teams premium view of um, the meeting recap. But if you don't have the premium license, it will show you um, some notes that were taken in the meeting and it will show mm -hmm. you the transcript. In order yeah. for Copilot to be able to work here, the transcript has to be enabled. You have to have the transcript in the meeting and your organization has to allow transcripts within a meeting. So if that if transcripts are not available, Copilot is not going to work for, for your meeting. And that's really important to take away. Mm -hmm. With a private meeting, like we see here, the recap tab is readily available. So we're going to be able to go and use Copilot and ask it questions during the meeting. And we can go to the recap and we can ask it questions after the meeting is actually over. Again, we're in a private meeting. Now I'm emphasizing private meeting because in testing, I tried this in a channel meeting. I prefer in my organization to use channel meetings because of some limitations around things like retention policies. So we like a mm -hmm. lot of channel meetings because it brings people in the team and in the channel into the meeting. We can still send out the invites if we want, but then people on the team can go back to the meetings channel that we've created and they can get the information, the recording, the transcript after the meeting's over and we can continue the conversation there. The recap tab is not currently supported in channel meetings and the co-pilot feature only works during the channel meeting. So if the channel meeting is live and the transcription is enabled, I can hit co-pilot and I can say, catch me up on the meeting, summarize the meeting, generate meeting notes for me. But as soon as the meeting's over and that transcription is closed, I can't go back and work with co-pilot anymore. I can't ask it to go and say, um, give me a meeting summary because uh, it won't uh, it won't be able to access um, that uh, that transcript Um from there. Now, I could probably download the transcript, throw it in Word and use Copilot over there and do something similar, but that's a lot of manual effort. So there's a difference mm -hmm. there between private meetings uh, and the recap and Copilot feature and channel meetings and the, um, the Copilot feature. So I just want to make sure people are aware of that. I hope that's something that Microsoft addresses in the future. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, that's feedback that I'll make sure that I provide. Yeah. So that's the after meeting. Then there's also the during meeting. So remember before, during, and after. Um, during the meeting, you're going to see Copilot in your your you know U bar or your control bar up here at the top. So again, if it's being transcribed, you see that this is being recorded and transcribed. You're able to open up that Copilot icon, and that's going to slide this pane out during the meeting. And this is wonderful because 
what you can see here is she's recapping what has happened so far. So you show up 15 minutes late to the meeting. You can ask about, you know, what have we been talking about? Where are we at? And it gives you some of those key takeaways. Um, in my experience, this is amazing. It does it very quickly. It does it very accurately. Um, this is like so awesome um, that I really hope that whenever you guys start getting Copilot, you'll you'll start really testing it with transcription because it's it's a superpower type of thing. Um, but you can get a recap, and then also during the meeting, maybe it's not just that you're out, you know, and you showed up late. You can get a sense of like what's the direction that people are going. Um, I view this a little bit as an accessibility type of play, right? Um, maybe maybe I zone out. Maybe I have some type of you know um, uh, attention deficit, something like that, that causes me to like you know lose focus. I can ask like you know oh, what did I miss or you know where are we going with this? Maybe I'm a person who has trouble reading people and emotions, things like that, you'll be able to say, you know, Hey, are, is, are people on board with this? Did we arrive at a decision? That's something that like, you know, even outside of an accessibility need, a, a lot of times I get to the end of the meeting and it's like, do we even decide on anything? <laughs> like, like, did we come up with a decision? So at the end of the meeting, you could ask what questions are unresolved. That will be really helpful. Um, and also like, did we arrive at a decision? What decisions were made? And it will give you that, that type of information that you're looking for. Something that's helpful that I've noticed is it will, uh, Copilot will nudge you towards the end of your meeting to say, hey, there's 10 minutes left in your meeting. Why don't you run a recap? That happens when you're transcribing. So I've, I've really been like jazzed about that, that um, it reminds me that it exists in the last 10 minutes of the meeting so that I can get a recap, I can do notes, but I can also say like, do we have anything left? Did we not get on something in the agenda? Or uh, what are the key takeaways? You know, so that you can take it and actually do something with the output from the meeting at the end. So um, I, I just love the during meeting experience. <laughs> I can't say enough good things about that one. I just had a great idea and I'm gonna have to test it out in a, in a, in a fake meeting maybe this weekend, yeah. but um, I'm gonna have to see if, um, during the context of the meeting, if we did in fact decide that next Tuesday is also going to be combined with Pete the Pirate Day and see what the outcome of that's actually going to be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, let, let's go on to the next slide. Let's see what we're, are we missing anything in this uh, slide here? So again, that's just deep diving on that particular during uh, meeting experience. And then here's some, some options. So again, summarizing the meeting, uh, this is something that, that I've been doing a lot is during the recap of the meeting, it's given me bullet points. And uh, something that I've noticed is whenever I ask for like key takeaways, it will give it to me in a bullet listed format, right? You know, Andy said he was gonna do this and he was gonna do it by Thursday. Tom said he was going to do this other thing by next week, stuff like that. Um, what I've found more helpful is not only saying summarize the meeting, but I've said the extra summarize the meeting and give me the key actions as a table. And that has really helped me personally to get it as a table because what it does is it auto formats it as here's the task, here's who it's assigned to, and here's the ETA or when it's due. Um, so that, that just makes me, it easier for me to read personally. So I want to put that out as like a little uh, pro tip um, for you. So do you have any like things that have been especially helpful for you during meetings? Have you used it very much during meetings? Yeah, I've tested it pretty extensively during meetings. That's how I've stumbled across the difference between the private meetings and mm -hmm. the channel meetings. For me, the <clears throat> the thing that I like the most and I mentioned this earlier, is it lets me be present. I don't have to worry about taking the meeting notes. I don't have to worry about the actionable yeah. items and the follow-ups. It does that. I can't tell you how many meetings I've had over the last few years where I get to the end of the meeting and I'm like, did I write down everything important? Did we, re did we record this? Do I need to go mm -hmm. back and like revisit it? Let me go and find, you know, my one note notebook and drill down for it. 
this streamlines that whole process so I can just be there. And then at the end, right before it ends, I just say, go ahead and generate meeting notes for me. And it gives me the summary, the key takeaways, and it gives me the action items. And then I can just take that, put it in whatever note source that I want. And then I have that information. That's been yeah. a really helpful thing for me. The other thing that I haven't had a chance to test yet, but I'm really looking forward to it is using this to deliver technical training, using this to deliver a 15 minute or a 30 minute mm -hmm. webinar on a Microsoft application. What I want to do is within the um, within the process of this, I want to be uh, go to Copilot and say, OK, um, uh, summarize this or create an outline of uh, of this technical training and then key takeaways and then use that as a way to follow up with the uh, with the audience um, and extend what I'm able to do delivering content, but also stream on some of that workflow. So I'm not having to do as much of that work manually. If it's able to go and mm -hmm. grab all the key points for, uh, from that training and then help me go ahead and draft the follow-up communications, that can be a huge time saver for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really good idea. I, I'll have to use that in our onboarding <laughs> sessions as we start bringing people online. I'll have to try that. Um, I definitely need to mark that down. I, I need to make sure I transcribe those meetings <laughs> so that one, I can give people key takeaways and format it that way, but also uh, to demo it live as well. This is something that um, you're going to have to figure out in your organization what your tolerance is for transcription. Um, that can be a very um, touchy subject for certain organizations and certain groups of folks. So um, there, there might be some cultural things to, to kind of get over corporate culture wise of like, you know, is transcription seen as a bad thing or as a helper in your organization um, to understand how much value you might get out of this. But uh, if you can do it, it's pretty awesome. Um, what does this video show here? Okay, so this is diving into the next section, which is about uh, group conversations. We have a whole section on that, don't we? No, the next section is going to be the uh, M365 chat. Oh, okay, cool. No. So we we can dive into this then, I guess. So, so the second thing in Teams, we got meetings as one. The other one is one-on-one -on -one chats or group conversations that you have. We're not talking channels. We're talking the chat tab. So we're in the little chat module right here. Inside of that chat area, any of your conversations you have going, whether they're one-on-one -on -one or uh or a group conversation, you will have this co-pilot button in the top corner. Again, the icon is probably going to change because we've got new logos and things like that. But when you invoke that icon at the very top, you're going to get a little flyout pane that comes out and you're now asking questions about this particular chat. So in the context or the confines of this group conversation, I want you to tell me about the past seven days. I want you to tell me what decisions were made, stuff like this. And this is fantastic for whenever you end up in a situation where, uh, where like you're in meetings back to back and three hours have gone by, but your, your group chat that you have, that's very active. You're like 150 chat messages deep now, and you don't know like how to make sense of it all. You can be like, okay, what did I miss? And it will give you those highlights. What's amazing about that is not only does it give you the highlights, but it will give you the reference points for those particular chat messages. So when you click on a reference, one of this like two, three, four, when you click on that, it's going to jump to that message in the conversation. So you get the context, right? This is very important in a team's chat where it's like, you know, Maria said this, Maybe I want to know what was said before and after Maria said that. If I click on it, it jumps to that level and then I can see it in the context of the conversation and get like more than just that one little nugget. I get a little bit more by seeing the content or the context as well. So I wanted to point out that we have kind of, you know, a long history of having difficulty finding things within chats. This does a really good job of jumping you to where it got that information from. So anything to add on group or one-on-one -on -one chats, bud? Um, can we go back to the point where it talks about um, like the prompt um, 
the the salt bay uh prompt portion of it yeah uh this part yeah right there yeah so um the time frames um highlights from the past seven days highlights for the last 30 days if i recall correctly it is a 30-day limit it won't go beyond that within the within the the conversation okay. yeah i didn't know but that. if you have retention policies in place it's not going to extend beyond the retention policy if you have a 24-hour retention mm -hmm. policy it's not going to go back beyond beyond yeah that. it's only going to give you what you could days, scroll up to go. yeah yeah um so it's only going to show you um that recap essentially uh beyond uh, that particular uh that particular point I haven't had a chance to really test this in depth because, you know, I've been testing as a party of one trying to keep things, you know, um, consolidated to just me within the, uh, within the organization as I'm kind of learning some of the ins and outs of it. But, um, I just wanted to point the, that, uh, that particular piece out, uh, hmm. that there are limits to how far back that that's actually going to go, but extending one other thing, this does work in the context of group chats. And so if you have, really active group chats and you're just not able to you know maybe it's interrupting with your focus time you can put the channel or chat on mute and then you will be able to go back and catch up and and get a highlight or summary and actionable items yeah. and then um engage from there yeah another thing i want to point out here that that it's across most all of copilot except for loop copilot is that it's just for you so this little reminder that's like yeah, you're in a chat conversation with other people and you're asking questions on the side. You're the only one who can see what you've been asking and what the outputs are of that. So keep that in mind. Like you're not, you know, if if you need a little bit of help or like, what is this person talking about? You're not going to look like a fool in front of everybody, right? Because this is your conversation with your co-pilot. So keep that in mind. Um, that is the exception for that is when you're in co-pilot with loop. So uh, Copilot and Loop, that is the place where you're doing um, collaborative prompting. So the other people will see what your prompt was. They'll be able to also like add their own to the prompt and stuff like that. But uh, when you're in Teams or Word or Outlook or something like that, no one's going to know what prompt you used uh, in order to generate that, that draft email, stuff like that. So um, yeah, we covered the references. We covered this kind of table format. This is again that prompt engineering where tell it the format you want and then it will give you the format that you want, right? You're not like if you just ask like what are the people's roles, it's probably going to give you a big massive text or maybe a bulleted list. Instead, if it's easier for you to consume a table, ask it for a table and it will help you with those types of things. So very cool. All right, let's get into the service description on this. Again, recap those conversations. What did I miss? Highlight things, key discussions. Did we get to a decision? Uh, what are the unanswered questions I need to follow up on? That type of stuff. Catch up on what you missed. Uh, create meeting agendas based on chat history. This is that before the meeting instance where you can say, all right, we're gonna have a chat with, or we're gonna have a, a meeting with this group of people what should I talk about, right? What are the key things that we're worried about? It can help you create that agenda. Just just chat with it over there in the sidebar. Um, and then, you know, who has some action items? When should we check in next? You know, what was our consensus? Ask Copilot that. It will help give you insights into what your meeting result was. And if you really think about it, mm -hmm. it's kind of like an administrative assistant in the in the and what it's doing in that in that particular role. And mm -hmm. that's a good segue into the next part. Yep. So in this section, we're going to be talking about M365 chat, also known as Microsoft 360 chat, formerly known as Copilot Preview, formerly known as Business Chat. Yes, this one's <laughs> been renamed a few times. It's now yeah. M365 chat. And this is an application that you install through the app bar along the um, left-hand navigation. And this application uh, is accessible through the chat option uh, inside of um, Microsoft Teams. This mm -hmm. is the virtual assistant experience. This feature, in my opinion, is the most powerful co-pilot feature that Microsoft has released. So we've saved the best for last because this, <laughs> this is what I use the most is yeah. truly the game changer. 
when you're working with M365 chat, you can have it in a central spot, a place for a continue, uh, uh, continued conversation. You can have it summarize information. You can have it catch you up on information. You can have it prepare you for an upcoming meeting, provide a recap of a previous meeting. You can have it summarize uh, content that's in the Microsoft Cloud from OneDrive, Teams, and SharePoint, as well as Outlook. You can have it um, uh, help you to communicate with other teammates to summarize conversations that you've had with those teammates. You can have it help mm -hmm. you to start drafting new content. This is the closest thing to Iron Man's Jarvis that I have seen yet, and it's called M365 Chat. So you're going to be able to work with it here in, uh, in Teams Chat, and this is available on the desktop, and it's available in the web experience. And mobile. <laughs> haven't well. tested it on mobile. But yeah, that's it, because it's just a chat conversation, it's also available on your phone, which means that you can click the little uh, microphone and you can talk to it, which is awesome. Um, some of the things that you can do here that, that they're showing is you get the most breadth across the Microsoft graph, right? So it's like, Hey, you know, here's some ideas. Let's, let's talk a little bit cat. So you could say like, what happened with Fabricam? What happened with a client, a customer that I have now it's going to look across your emails, your chats, your meetings that you had, the files you've worked on, and it's going to give you much more rich understanding of what's going on with Fabricam from all of those different sources. And you're going to see a lot of different types of references come in whenever you're talking to M365 chat. So uh, again, all of this stuff is referenced. It's kind of a lot like Bing chat. You're used to getting references and things like that. Um, whenever you drop this down, those references, you're going to see emails. That's with a little email icon. I, th I think I've seen it with an Outlook icon. You're going to get different types of files. So that's going to give you like, whether it's a SharePoint page, that'll give you like a little web icon or, you know, some other like web type of resource. Or if it's like a PowerPoint or a Word document, you're going to see where that came from. If you drop down this little carrot right here, it's also going to give you like a little snippet of the email and then like where that, that reference came from. So you can see it in context. You can also click on the reference. It will open up that file, or in this case, an email. It will open up the email inside of uh, Outlook Web Access. So um, yeah, the references are, are like the most rich here, the most breadth of references, uh, of resources, stuff like that. So you can see she's getting an update about a client, um, you know, what happened yesterday. There's the context of that pre presentation context of the email that she got, stuff like that. So you can hone in a little bit on here and say like, okay, Mona is involved. So help me prep for my, my meeting with Mona. It understands who Mona is, right? Because you're doing a, a turn by turn uh, conversation about this particular subject. So it knows like, okay, I'm talking about this Mona, not some other Mona. And you have five emails with her you agreed on something. She said she was going to follow up about this other item. So now you're prepping for a meeting and kind of moving on with your day. So um, a lot of stuff within that M365 chat. Here's an example of building strategy within M365 chat. So <clears throat> to mute that in my ear. So following on with that meeting, you can say like, okay, I want to prepare for this meeting still, but I want something else like Q1 proposal or projections for Q1. So it reached out to an Excel spreadsheet and it started pulling that in into a consumable condensed version that's just an ad hoc table that says, hey, here's some of the insights from what's deep into that huge Excel spreadsheet that, that you worked with. And now you've kind of tied the information you've already been chatting with, you've brought in a new resource and added to it so that you're building uh, something new rather than just recapping what already exists. So this is the understanding of like, you know, doing a SWOT analysis, like, all right, I've brought in more information. Now I want to like get some kind of insight about it. So based on what we know about the client, 
based on what we know about the performance from this spreadsheet, give me a SWOT analysis. And it can do that. It can give you like, all right, you know, you should focus on these things for strengths. You should, you know, try to mitigate these types of threats, things like that. So that's like working with it and building a strategy, having that conversation. Um, you can have up to 30 turns with a M365 chat message. So you get this kind of building on itself for up to 30 times. And then what you'll do is new chat and then it will it'll start over again and you can talk about something else. So that's another thing to keep in mind when we talk about it going off the rails and hallucinating. Um, and it will tell you in the lower right hand corner that this is turn two of 30. This is turn three and four of 30. And yeah. once you go to a new chat, though, you cannot return back to the previous chat. It's it's compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. I wish there were more of a visual indicator to separate that. Hey, you know, this is a previous chat and this is like yeah. a, a new chat. I wish there was a way to kind of like maybe a chat history off to the side, kind of like they're doing in a Bing chat and Bing chat enterprise. Um, mm -hmm. Just so I can go back and maybe revisit a previous conversation for a little while. I think that would be um, really interesting. And I'm also really curious to see long-term effects, how retention policy is going to apply to the conversation that I have here. So if I have a conversation mm -hmm. with um, M365 chat, is that going to be subject to re a 30 day retention? I'm testing that now. It's going to be a few more weeks before. Yeah, I know from my experience, yes, um, it's just a conversation. So yeah. um, from what I've seen, yeah, it's it's going to respect your organization's uh, retention for chats because it's a it's a uh, application chat that you're doing. So um, something that's shown right here is something that that was announced again at this Surface event back in September. We have not seen this yet, but what I'm excited about is. One one issue that I have right now with Copilot or that I've I've seen from these demos as well is it feels like you're doing a little bit of context switching, right? Like I want to build a slide outline, um, you know, for this slide deck that I'm working on. I might do that in chat, but in order to move that into PowerPoint, you have to like go into PowerPoint, open up Copilot, and then you know create from this outline. Um, what we've seen to kind of smooth that out is Microsoft announced these kind of action buttons inside of the chat where it'll say, oh, well, you know, you want to add a slide or you want to create some slides out of an outline, it's going to intelligently offer, well, let's open it up in PowerPoint or write me an email draft to Mona. It will say, well, hey, let's open that up in Outlook and it will send it over to the place where you're going to keep working. Um, I think that's going to smooth out that kind of like context switching a little bit. So I wanted to call that button out because I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah, Daryl says... Imagine threaded conversations you can go to. Um, that That's kind of like something that I miss from Bing Chat to Bing Chat Enterprise. When we all moved over to Bing Chat Enterprise, we lost that chat history, right? The ability to rename our conversations and pick up where we left off. Um, I, I hope that Microsoft brings that back in some way, you know, that's also compliant with all the governance and the reasons they probably pulled it out at the beginning. Um, I don't know, Andy, if you've heard anything about them bringing chat history back into like a Bing chat enterprise. I have not. I understand why they want to limit that to, you know, a single turn and then, you know, the conversation's gone. But here mm -hmm. I am logged in as an enterprise teammate. I have an enterprise license. I'm subject to the enterprise compliance and um, security mm -hmm. policies. I've authenticated into the into the system. I'm using multi-factor authentication. It seems like there's enough barriers in place that I should be able to have the chat history with M365 chat and be able to go and have part of a conversation here and go to another conversation there and then return back to a previous mm -hmm. conversation. I think all the mechanisms are in place for that. So maybe in the future, we'll see that. Yeah. Another comment from Daryl here, like um, imagine it being like Jarvis where it, it follows you around the different co-pilot experiences that would be killer too, especially if you're in kind of the GTD or Pomodoro type of way of doing things like where, all right, I am going to work on this thing for the next hour. If Copilot just understood that, right? And the apps that you flip around in, if you didn't have to explain yourself to Copilot again, that would be really cool where it just knows, hey, this focus time block on John's calendar is going to focus on this project 
and then it just kind of keeps that in mind, that would be amazing. Uh, but I haven't heard anything about something like that. So mm-hmm. sorry, Daryl. <laughs> and one other thing to point out here, um, since we're talking mm-hmm. about like feedback, can you go back for um, in the lower yeah. right hand corner? of of a response like when it generates a response and it uh, pops up on the screen you're going to see a thumbs up Mm -hmm. and a thumbs down that's how you as a user are going to be able to provide feedback around that particular response so you're going to be able thumbs up or thumbs down it's going to open up a dialogue and it's going to allow you to provide detailed information around that you have the Mm -hmm. option to allow it to collect some analytics or screen recording and then um, you can send that to Microsoft and that's just gonna help the service to get better. So I do encourage people uh, as you're using this to use the thumbs up and thumbs down to provide that feedback, especially if something is not um, behaving as, as expected so that Microsoft gets that information and their engineers are able to go into it. This is the best, one of the best ways to provide feedback. There's also mm-hmm. a separate feedback mechanism. There's a feedback portal that they have available where you can provide feedback, you can upvote other feedback from other individuals, you can um, report bugs, and you can um, also suggest features. I highly encourage you to take advantage mm-hmm. of that because this is a new technology, and these ideas are only going to help the product to get better. Reporting the bugs is only going to help it to get better. So please use the, those feedback mechanisms. I don't even work for Microsoft, but I just want to see it get better, and, um, and it's yeah. great uh, uh, out of the gate. But there's room, you know, there's room for improvement in any kind of process. And so using those feedback mechanisms is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, to speed up a little bit, because I we're we've done done two hours already. Um, This is one of my favorite uh, features in Copilot or the things I've used in Copilot personally. I went back. I remember uh, talking about like project updates, right? Give me a summary of something that's going on across the breadth of my 365 experience. This is that example of like draft a summary of what happened in the, all of these meetings. Or what I mentioned is give me a status update on a project. I want you to go back 30 days and give me like key achievements, give me things to work on for the next 30 days. This is that example inside a business chat. So you're going to be mostly doing that in a business chat m365 chat uh type of window where you're like all right you know give give my team an update write a recap find this information that information kind of move on with it um this is very very helpful so i haven't seen that action button though where it like sends it over to a channel that's something that that came out in that september uh announcement that they had yeah i'm still waiting on that as well (laughs) yeah so moving back business chat or m365 chat is what it's going to be called uh at general availability bringing all that data together whether it's your email your chats your files loop components all of those types of things bringing all of that into a single chat interface that's the power of having that that's why i live in it for the majority of the time um is because it has the most access to everything that that i have access to um, remember it, it respects like what you personally have access to, um, doing strategy, coming up with SWOT analysis, uh, getting recommendations, things like that, updating your projects and programs, super, super u- useful for that type of thing as well. And then on to the, uh, service description. Again, you can recap those conversations, catch me up highlights, stuff like that. Um, and then get answers to specific questions get agendas, you know, generate agendas, get before the meeting to make your meeting more useful, and then identify those follow-ups, like coming out of a meeting, what can we do to, um, to you know, actually get actions out of our meeting and have more productivity on the other side. So, all right, um, we're at two hours. <clears throat> so, Andy, what do you, th- what do you think? You want to come back and... Uh, you know, circle back into some of these other items when we can demo it. Cause I think loop and whiteboard, especially I, I would like to be able to show it somehow, you know, after GA. So right. I'm wondering if we should continue this, uh, on. Yeah. We're limited on, on some of the video based content that we have for the remaining apps. Um, so I think it is a good, good stopping point to kind of circle back to okay. some of the other apps when we can demo. 
Um, that also um, keeps us honest and hopefully keeps you coming back because we have mm -hmm. a lot more to potentially talk about once this goes to uh, the GA and um, we are yeah. able to uh, to demo. Um, I think like on the up next agenda, uh, Microsoft mm -hmm. Stream, uh, there's a few announcements around that for things like summarizing videos, being able to ask mm -hmm. questions about that video content, locating people and topics within the context of that. Their roadmap, the, the the stream roadmap is is just crazy right now with uh, with features and and content that they want to push out. SharePoint's made a number of announcements, um, and they've demoed some mm -hmm. of this um, uh, at various uh, events. But SharePoint, they're talking about the ability to create sites and to create pages and have Copilot assist in that, and then even creating pages from files. I'm really interested to see where that's going to go. Um, Going over to OneDrive real quick, um, OneDrive working with files with natural language, being able to ask questions and summarize the files that are in your OneDrive. I think M365 chat does a little bit of that now, but to be able to do it in OneDrive and not have to context switch, kind of having that that uh, Copilot experience follow you would be really helpful. In, in the mm -hmm. Viva world, <laughs> there, uh, there's been a number of different announcements there um, related to how they're going to integrate uh, Copilot mm -hmm. Um, but Viva Engage is one of the ones we have listed here uh, where we're, they're talking about being able to um, draft posts um, with mm -hmm. topic recommendations, uh, working with replies and better answers and summarizing threads. I'm really interested yeah. in that from a training and user adoption standpoint. We rely heavily on Viva Engage. So if we could leverage more yeah. of our knowledge base and our, our institutional information and have kind of an intelligent agent functioning in there along with us, uh, that would really streamline our ability to scale mm -hmm. and reach our organization. So I'm really, really yeah. um, interested to uh, um, to see that. Yeah, to jump back up a little bit uh, to answer this question that just came in the <clears throat> chat, November 1st is uh, Microsoft Copilot general availability. We're super looking forward to that. Um, it's it's only a few short days away, and then you know we'll be able to show a lot more things and and talk about that stuff. These items that Andy talked about, what's next? That's going to be more of uh, like you know later this year, early next year type of announcements that they've made. Uh, there's a public roadmap for Copilot, so if you go to the traditional roadmap that we've got, um, also Daryl has some co-pilot and loop stuff that we didn't get to yet. Um, so after GA, we're going to show off you know, a lot of this type of functionality, but he's got videos as well. So check out Daryl's channel. Um, I want to end out with just quickly, like in three minutes, my day in the life with co-pilot and what I've used it for, because when you get your hands on this starting maybe next week or into November, what the heck do I do with this? And jumping all the way to like transforming your life and work will never be the same. It's not going to happen on day one, right? So try to think through like what you do, where you can use it throughout your day and kind of sprinkle co-pilot in like Salt Bay. Sprinkle co-pilot in where you can. Um, in my own world as an enterprise architect, I do these things in boxes for my job, right? These are the things... I need to take care of, I need to keep on top of. But then, you know, the thing that overwhelms me is everything else that's on my plate, right? It's all of the chat messages, it's all the relationships I keep up with, the emails where I've been mentioned, the meetings that I have to attend that are back to back and overlapping. And it's just, it's so much that what I have found is an example that I can explain of using Copilot in the real world day to day is this, I hope it inspires you as we kind of end out this, this segment, is starting out, I wake up, I get added to a huge email thread, right? 35 emails deep. Now with Copilot, you will be able to summarize that email chain and get started on your day better, get the, the key topics out of it so that it doesn't slow down your day right off the bat. Whenever you start out your day again, I come and sit down at my desk I missed a three o'clock in the morning meeting because most people I work with are in London. If they happen to transcribe that meeting, try getting action items out of a meeting that you missed that you couldn't make it to because of a conflict. You're getting ready for your, your day. Maybe you've got one-on-ones. Try asking Copilot about other people. Hey, what's the latest with Tom? It knows that I work with a gentleman named Tom Krennigan a lot. It will match that up because of the Microsoft graph 
and it will help me pr uh, prepare for like, what are the outstanding things? What do you owe Tom? Moving on, get in a project update. Again, we talked about getting like, what were the achievements? What were the challenges and opportunities moving forward? Try that within the M365 chat. Get some ideation going within Microsoft Loop. Again, that collaborative space, things like that, where when you're in a meeting and you're in Loop, you're going to want to try to like pop Copilot in there and get some ideation going that way. Um, at the end, working with Word and PowerPoint, like, hey, I need a script for this. I don't know the structure of the PowerPoint that I want to build. Help me out with the structure. Help me with the blank page. And then to end out the day, ask Copilot about what's going on tomorrow. Kind of use it to spring you into the next day and get you ready with like pre-reads or things that you need to kind of study up on. Um, that's how I've been using it in my day. I hope it inspires uh, you guys as you start getting your hands on it between now and the next time that we talk. So... Any words of wisdom you want to add, Andy? You have a really long day. <laughs> <laughs> I do, yeah, yeah. Usually, usually I, I wake up to a bunch of stuff from London, <laughs> you know, and uh, usually I'm sending them a bunch of stuff at the end of my day. So we, we play tennis that way. <laughs> words of wisdom. Keep it within work hours. <laughs> Separate that family life from that work life. Um, no, I think that that was a really good... Um, day in the life um, scenario with uh, with copilot uh you're a little bit more mature in it than me you've had access to it a little bit longer i'm really looking forward to seeing how i'm going to be able to implement it and maybe stream on some of the stuff that i do so we'll revisit a day in the life of andy yeah. uh in the in the future um so i'll take some uh, some inspiration from that but yeah. um as we bring it to a close here, uh, we're going to circle back with more Copilot. This is not the end of the Copilot journey for us. I think this is actually just the start. We hope this has been helpful for all of you um, to kind of provide some insights into what's what's going on uh, with um, with Copilot and to be able to prepare as an end user and set those expectations. Um, we're going to try our best to divide this up into some smaller videos, post those on our YouTube channels and, and get that information out there. And then once things go GA, we're looking forward to being able to demo and actually show you some of this, uh, this stuff live as we continue our journey um, and our, our learning path with it. Um, I think the best way to learn about this is as a community, and you all have been a really great community for us. So we want to keep the conversation going. I'm going to do my best to go and grab all of the links to all the various resources that we had throughout this presentation and put them on one mm -hmm. blog post for you. So you have one stop shop for all of that uh, information. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work um, around that. Um, so continue the journey with us, follow up with us on social media, share this, uh, this information. Totally shameless plug. If you happen to be in Chicago next week, I'll be at 365 EduCon. <laughs> Uh, I'm actually delivering a full day workshop on um, uh, Microsoft Copilot. I'm really looking forward yeah. to doing that. I got a breakout session on Wednesday around Microsoft Copilot. I'll be at the conference all week. I'll be in the Chicago area all week. So if you're there, reach out, say hello. Otherwise, we'll see you uh, here on 365 Deep Dive. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Appreciate it.